Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about what I call attention deficit world, which means how our whole society is becoming more ADHD-like, and whether or not you yourself are on the ADHD spectrum, it behooves you to learn more about ADHD because this is the direction our world is moving in. So as usual, I'll start with the take-home message. That'll be a few minutes, and then I'll launch into the main presentation. So the take-home message is that the COVID epidemic and disruptions to the work, work-life balance and work schedules highlighted some ongoing trends. They didn't, they did create a few new problems, but they mostly accentuated what was already going on. And we saw that rates of ADHD diagnoses, particularly in adults and particularly in women, minoritized individuals who had been previously underdiagnosed, have been increasing substantially in the last few years, as well as the number of stimulant prescriptions that are being written and fulfilled, filled, not fulfilled. Um, the evidence indicates that these are real changes, not just alterations in awareness of reporting about ADHD. And my claim, so much of this is theoretical and conjectural, but I think there's a wealth of data to back it up, is that rates are going up because environmental factors are shifting many individuals further along the ADHD spectrum. And this, although maybe the most has been written about how cell phones, social media immersion have increased our distractibility, our impulsive reactivity, our emotional dysregulation, our scatteredness and distractedness. It's not just cell phones. I'll get into some of the other causes. Um, but that those have real impacts on our biology, and I'll go into why. And this doesn't mean it's a hopeless situation, that everyone's going to have ADHD. Um, and part of why it's not hopeless is that much of what we already know about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder can be applied directly to new cases, partial cases, ongoing situations, because the data so far supports that these treatments work for a broad range of ADHD-like conditions. So jumping into the message itself, this is my 200th video on this channel. Um, it might be the most important one. It is the, um, the book I've been working on intermittently for the last few years. That This is the core message here. And why this is so important, it's not just for people who have existing ADHD. It's not just for those people who had mild cases and have been shifted into full-blown ADHD. It's not just for those who are never before on the ADHD spectrum and now finding themselves distracted, impulsive, irritable, other ADHD symptoms. Um, why this is important is because ADHD is a serious condition. Um, there's significant morbidity connected with it, there's significant mortality, morbidity is sickness, mortality is early death, and not only does it cause bad things, it's treatable. And three, often ADHD has at least as big an impact on those around the individual as the individual with ADHD. And part of this is because part of ADHD itself can make people less attentive, less aware of how they're interacting with others in their world. So I am arguing we are in the midst of a huge biopsychosocial experiment for which none of us have given informed consent. At some level, we are doing a cultural appropriation of the ADHD community without asking them for it. But again, there's information there we should be using rather than ignoring. And even if you think you have minimum exposure, that if you don't walk around with your cell phone, if you don't spend a lot of time on social media, if you sleep well and you exercise and have a healthy diet, you are still exposed to other people who themselves have shortened attention spans, who are distractible, who are irritable, and that they are interacting with you. So you're already interacting with this world. So I do have a previous video in this channel about the evidence for why that the studies we're seeing showing higher rates of ADHD, that th those are representing real changes and real diagnoses, not just people becoming more aware of it, not just from changes in definition. If it were definitional changes, we would have expected 
to see a big surge right after the definition changed. That's not particularly what we're seeing. Um, the most reliable studies for the claim that we're seeing increased rates of ADHD are studies that are using the exact same methodology year after year in pretty much the same populations and are seeing increases. And again, there's a number of those. There's much greater difficulty when studies are conducted in different populations under different criteria to know what the quote real rate of ADHD is. But again, using the same methodology, we are seeing a number of series using the same methodology, all indicating an increase. And again, that increase is considerably greater among adults than among children. Most studies have shown a pretty stable rate in ADHD in children at a high level, but relatively stable, where it's increasing in adults, um, particularly in older adults, and that's defined as anyone older than I am, um, also particularly in women and people of color, so people who populations where ADHD was almost certainly underdiagnosed and so some of this is catch up but these real increases seem to be present. So interestingly there is considerable pushback from the ADHD community itself both among patients or people who have it or don't identify as patients as well as researchers in the field and part of this is that the ADHD diagnosis has been so stigmatized so trivialized people are told this isn't something real you don't really have it that I think a large percentage of both patients and researchers sort of cling to, we have good strong genetic information that this is a real biological phenomena. So I'll we'll go into a little distraction here um, to support the claim that all of our conditions, anything dealing with human bodies, our interactions both between genes, always between genes and the environment, it's always nature and nurture. So Huntington's disease. Huntington's is a genetic condition. It's a neurologic condition that usually by their 30s and 40s, people start developing movement disorders and often cognitive decline and psychiatric issues. Um, in 1993, the gene was sequenced for this. It's a gene on chromosome 4. And it's what's called an autosomal dominant. So it's not on a sex-linked chromosome. It's one on the others. And dominant means if you inherit one copy from either parent, you will get the disease. And the, the term is called penetrance, and that's what percentage of individuals who have the gene will get the condition. And most experts will I mean, actually use Huntington's as an example. This gene has 100% penetrance. If you have the gene, you will develop Huntington's disease. Now, some people develop in their 20s, some develop in their 30s and 40s, some even wait till their 60s and 70s, but if you have it, you will get it. But that's not actually completely true. So say you inherit the condition and you're hit by a car at the age of 20, this is a little morbid, and you die, that means you've never developed Huntington's disease. And that may seem like a trivial condition or example, but it's pointing to the fact that even in conditions that are 100% heritable, environmental conditions matter. So getting back to ADHD. Um, again, I think some of the resistance among people in the field who have it or who are working with it is that if it can, if the rates are increasing, then that casts doubt on whether ADHD is a real condition. That That is just a ridiculous worry or concern. So ADHD, we know exists on a spectrum of severity. We know if it's, you have enough symptoms over extensive enough time, you have meet the full criteria, but we know lots of people have a smaller number of symptoms or don't express it in as many situations or whatever the situation. Those people are called, said to have subsyndromal, you know, below the level of criteria, who have it compared to uh, subsyndromal sub ADHD. But what we know is if you expose someone who has subsyndromal ADHD to an environment that either puts increased demands on them or takes support away, or you do something else to their brain, you are pushing them, some of those individuals anyway, into full-blown, officially meeting most of the criteria for ADHD. 
And I would argue that much of our modern world is moving people who had minimal or almost no detectable ADHD symptoms, so maybe sub-sub-syndromal, onto the ADHD spectrum. So with this spectrum concept, anything that can cause worsening of ADHD can actually cause new cases of ADHD. So why do we make diagnoses to begin with? And I've talked about this before, so my shorthand is we do it to understand complex phenomena, just to put a name on it and tell people there's other people like them that have that. And this is, you know, if you have this, you may also likely have this and this and this, and you may be more inclined to have these other mental or physical conditions or problems, or you may actually be spared and be less likely to have certain conditions. So it provides understanding it also gives a general prediction of what is likely to happen to this person, what kind of situations are they likely to get involved in, and what is the likely course. Is this likely to be more severe over time or resolve over time? And the third, so understanding, prediction, and guiding effective treatment. So if you have an accurate diagnosis, you have a good idea, that's not a guarantee, of what medications, what non-medication therapies, may be helpful in reducing your symptoms. Now our diagnostic manual, particularly DSM-5 for mental health, is officially no neutral regarding the origins of different mental health conditions. And this was because when it was founded more than half a century ago, there were bitter battles between behaviorists, between Freudians, between Jungians, everyone with their own idea of what caused mental health. And they decided we're just going to describe these conditions without getting into what's the cause of it. So we have explicitly a diagnostic system that does not want to look at what is causing a condition. But for almost every condition, there's what's called a rule out. It's not that condition if it's due to another condition. So for example, um, if you have depressive symptoms, but it's coming, you didn't have them before, and you developed hypothyroidism, then it's not considered depression. It's considered depressive symptoms caused by or in the setting of hypothyroidism. But I would argue there's a huge logical mix-up of, of saying we don't know the origins of any of these things, but if you have it from a known condition, then you don't really have it. I mean, we don't do that with you know, broken legs. You have a broken leg or a fractured tibia or whatever, how we want to find it. It doesn't matter if it came from a motor vehicle accident or if you had rickets which predisposed you or thyroid problems or you've tripped because we're on benzodiazepines. All of those are a broken leg and they will heal. Now, I'd say it's useful to know the origins and know, know contributing factors. So I'm not saying we should ignore that information, but I am proposing until we know more and we've been groping for more for a very long time, we should probably be altering our rule outs and saying that means it's not this condition. Because I would say if we're defining these conditions by collections of symptoms and persistence over time and their patterns of how they show up, then eliminating from the diagnosis because you know something else is going on just doesn't make sense anyway and particularly with treatment we know and I'll, I'll may touch on this later something so if you have an ADHD picture that's due to head trauma I understand why people initially when we we're treating them were wary of no oh, don't use stimulants even though it looks like ADHD and that responds to stimulants this is a brain that's been injured and is vulnerable. But most of the research we have to date suggests that the ADHD symptomatology, when it looks like ADHD, regardless of the origin, tends to respond to ADHD medication or non-medication treatment. That's a sweeping generalization, but again, I would argue that's what the data show so far. So if you have post-COVID, if you have traumatic brain injury, then many of those pictures to resolve or symptoms decrease with some of the same treatments that work with ADHD. So again, I'm not arguing ignore factors that we know may be involved, um, but I'm saying we should not ignore the central 
ADHD symptoms and features. So part of what I'm going to be talking about is, is implying, implying too much of it that the factors we've identified that are associated with the ADHD-like picture are clearly having a causal role. I think some of them will turn out to be causal. Some of them may just be associations. I am not making careful distinctions through all of this. Um, you know, a good example is traumatic brain injury. We have pretty good evidence, kids or young adults or older adults who never had any ADHD symptomatology and not all brain trauma, but certain particularly frontal cortex damage looks like an ongoing and permanent ADHD state. So there we can say, yes, in some individuals it was clearly a cause and effect situation, but it gets more muddled because we know having ADHD predisposes people to brain injuries because a whole host of physical bodily injuries, but including head trauma. So here there's two-way causality and feedback loops, and it emphasizes one of the other points I'm going to make is that many of these factors are feedback loops. If you have more severe ADHD, you're more likely to get head trauma. If you have head trauma, you're more likely to show up with ADHD symptomatology. And that makes this problem particularly convoluted. Why, what, do I, what, what is going on here? What's ADHD about? And this is oversimplification, but ADHD is commonly defined as a collection of executive dysfunction or problems of executive functions. Things like control of attention, how we direct, maintain, switch attention, working memory, impulse control, time management, emotional regulation, hyperactivity, being able to self-monitor and regulate your own behavior. And the prefrontal cortex seems to be a particularly important brain region for all of these tasks. And that prefrontal cortex seems particularly vulnerable to a bunch of injuries or problems, two different reasons. One is anatomic, and that's even twofold. It's a big area, and it's right at the front of the head, which we lead with. We walk in a forward-going way, so more vulnerable to trauma, more vulnerable to reverberations within the skull. Um, so anatomically there, and there's increasing evidence, and a lot of this is based on work from Amy Arnston and her lab at Yale, but others have contributed as well that the frontal cortex, probably because it has such a strong reliance on a subset of glutamate receptors called the MMDA receptors, so those are over-enriched in the forebrain and the most sophisticated parts of our brain, um, newest and most sophisticated, and that because of that NMDA receptors, they do useful things for that prefrontal cortex executive functions, but they're also particularly vulnerable to certain types of neuroinflammation and other insults that other glutamate excitatory receptors aren't as susceptible to. So that may be why we're seeing a convergence of ADHD and dementia and traumatic brain injury and PTSD showing so many overlapping or sometimes even identical symptomatology. So I would argue when we're talking about ADHD, um, we're talking about six different groups of individuals. So one is what are primarily defined the traditional ADHD, strong genetic heritage, probably parents or other family members have it, symptoms start showing up in childhood. Um, so two are what I call the subsyndromal con converts. So often fairly similar histories, but their symptomatology was always mild enough that they could get through. Maybe they weren't doing their homework, but they still got good enough grades. They got into a good school or found a good job. Um, but then something else happens like COVID and they're forced to work from home and juggle having screaming kids and they just completely fall apart. And that's again, they were already on the symptom syndrome uh, spectrum and external events pushed them further along that spectrum. So they went from becoming sub to fully meeting the criteria, and although some of them, again, this is a difficult terrain. Even if they had a family history of some ADHD symptoms but weren't a full-figured ADHD person in childhood, 
you know, now that they are fully meeting current criteria, how do we define whether they were meeting enough criteria before the age of 12 or not? So third group I'm going to we're talking about here is what's called secondary ADHD. Um, so those are people who didn't particularly display ADHD symptoms in childhood, don't particularly have a genetic heritage or family background, and then something in traumatic brain injury is the most common identified cause, but maybe excessive street drug use, maybe post-COVID or other viral syndromes. So created in someone who wasn't previously on the ADHD spectrum at all, creates a full picture of ADHD. And again, many of these people do seem to respond to traditional treatments. Um, many people have resisted considering this ADHD because we know the etiology and the symptoms didn't begin before age 12. Um, I'm, I, I used to actually subscribe to that view. That, that we could almost always ascribe others to other conditions and it didn't matter. You know, these weren't real ADHD. But now, again, partly because the explan explan explanatory value of a diagnosis, because the predictions of what they're likely to do or not do moving forward with treatment or without treatment are useful, and because it helps guide useful treatments, I think we should be more fully embracing these are cases of ADHD. And remember a specific example, a woman I worked with more than a decade ago reported no previous ADHD symptoms, hit her head skating, and had a traumatic brain injury. And subsequent to that injury, she displayed a full picture of classic ADHD um, symptoms. Some of it were responsive to medications. Um, over at least a decade, there was no resolution or overall change or improvement in her symptoms. You know, telling her she doesn't really have ADHD because it was from brain trauma just doesn't seem to me serving much of a function, useful function. So what I call tertiary ADHD, and I'm making that up, I don't see other people using it. So my fourth category are people who have a condition like sleep deprivation, or maybe what was going on during COVID, you know, working from home, chaotic household, or maybe people who are so immersed in their cell phone social media world, or maybe people with mom brain from pregnancy, or maybe people in a flare-up of an auto-induced state. Many of these pictures can replicate a full range of ADHD symptomatology. Some of these situations, these ADHD symptoms are reversible, so short-term sleep deprivation. If you keep someone up all, you know, a night or two, they look, they are highly distractible, they are emotionally reactive, they have poor impulse control, they have disruptions of short-term memory, they look like an ADHD picture, except we know this is sleep deprivation caused, and usually if you let them sleep, they recover completely. But what we don't know is how long being immersed in an ADHD-like state, how many times you replicate that before aspects of neuroplasticity are changing your brain so you have a semi-permanent or more permanent ADHD-like state. So the fifth and sixth conditions are, and some of these clearly overlap or blur a little bit. Number five would be people who look like they have ADHD, but we can clearly attribute it to another condition. So I've had individuals who were so anxious um, because of crises going on or imagined crises that they became highly distractible, irritable. Again, pretty broad spectrum of ADHD problems and yet that resolved with medicine that usually, like an SSRI or cognitive therapy directed towards anxiety that then resolves complete ADHD symptomatology. So should we not even use the word ADHD there? Or should we be saying temporary ADHD arising from anxiety? I'm not sure what our nomenclature should be. It's important to say, you know, depression, PTSD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, dementia can all mimic ADHD. And I'm going to focus a little bit on dementia for a second, because 
We often parse, well, ADHD isn't a tension problem. Dementia is a memory problem. These are distinct and different things. And if you're not paying attention, you're not storing or encoding things properly, you're gonna have problems with memory. There was a study that got lots of attention, I think in 2023, it was an Israeli study claiming that ADHD was a huge predictor for dementia and they actually excluded anyone who had any ADHD diagnosis before the age of 50. So all these were new onset of an ADHD picture, but a high proportion of those people within five to 10 years, not remembering the exact timeline, developed dementia. I would argue the more parsimonious explanation is that they were actually seeing early stages of dementia, which looked more like ADHD than they looked like the profound apathy and memory problems of more advanced dementia. So that's our fifth group of confusing individuals regarding an ADHD diagnosis. And I'll address the sixth group because this, and many of the people who attack the ADHD diagnoses um, claim that there's a large group of people who don't have anything related to ADHD. They're just faking symptoms to get stimulant medication. And that's why the diagnosis itself is evil and bad because it encourages such behavior. And some of these people deny the existence of ADHD altogether. I'm not questioning there are clearly some individuals who fit that definition. Much more often, many of these people who are faking it clearly, even before they dabbled with prescription or street drugs, had a number of ADHD symptoms which were affecting them in a number of settings. So they were somewhere on the subsyndromal spectrum. Some of them were full blown ADHD. And if you look at studies after study, you know, asking these people why are they taking these drugs, it's the commonest answer is to improve executive functions, to focus better, to not be as distracted, to have better short-term memory, to be able to function at their job or at their work or at their school better. It's not, some of them are taking it to feel better, or to get high, but not too many. So I've argued we have a whole bunch of biopsychosocial feedback loops. Again, how many of these are direct causes or association? Biologically, it's things like sleep deprivation, exposure to leads, exposure to plastics. I do have a talk on plastics. Um, things like fetal alcohol syndrome shows up. One of the prominent symptoms is a cluster of ADHD traits. Um, decreased amount of exercise and increase in sedentary, and those are often together, but they're not the same, are associated with so again, the feedback potential loop is that those predict who's likely to show ADHD symptoms and people with ADHD symptoms are more likely to be not exercising enough and more sedentary. There's also studies looking at diet. People with ADHD in general tend to have less nutritious, more junk food diet. And there are, again, forward-looking studies of looking at people's diet at one point in time and poorer diets in terms of more junk food are associated with higher rates of ADHD at a future point in time. There's also a number of viruses. So, so a post-COVID ADHD-like picture. And again, that doesn't mean everyone who has long COVID or post-COVID shows up primarily with an ADHD-like picture, but it actually is the most common presentation. You know, some people have breathing problems, some have others. Many people don't have any post-COVID, but it's not specific to COVID. So. There's a study that came out just this week that um, post herpes zoster, so chickenpox virus that causes shingles, a disproportionate number of people have attention, impulse control, distractibility, concentration, cognitive and emotional problems that look like an ADHD picture. We also know that there's psychosocial variables, so like parenting style, negligent or authority. So either too lax or overly authoritative or authoritarian, um, so dictatorial, decreeing without explaining, not just authoritative is sticking to standards and expectations. Authoritarian is sort of capriciously imposing your will and getting angry and harsh when people fail to meet that. Um, so that's 
associated with, again, more severe ADHD. But again, given the spectrum concept of ADHD, anything that can make ADHD more severe also is capable of changing people who would only have been subsyndromal to full-blown ADHD. Um, and I've talked a little bit about this, so I won't go into great detail, but clearly one of the biggest social factors is our immersion in a social media cell phone world. Um, not only is this spraying huge amounts of information at us, it's delivered really quickly, it demands immediate responses, at the same time it's distracting and interrupting us with notices and notifications. Um, and numerous studies suggest that immersion in that world does lead to shorter attention spans, does lead to distractibility, does lead to making more mistakes from missing information, does lead to greater irritability and emotional um, overexpressiveness. And that again, having ADHD itself means you are more likely to oversaturate yourself with this modern cell phone social media culture and Again, we are still struggling to find how much of this is caused and how much this effect and how much this is associated. But I think there's growing and compelling evidence that these are important factors pushing us and making us into ADHD world. And again, this is all not something to despair about. Again, some of the hopefulness is there's a fair amount of study on ADHD, and this is a gross overgeneralization. But in general, the medications like stimulants, clonfacine, amantadine, that seem to help with classic ADHD do seem to help with post-traumatic brain injury ADHD pictures or post-COVID ADHD pictures. Now, maybe average doses are lower for these medications, but the same medications seem to work. And similarly, there's some evidence that the cognitive behavioral therapy, the family therapy approaches, educational approaches about what ADHD entails, and here's what you can do about it, also work in pictures of ADHD that aren't our type 1 class standard ADHD. Um, so other lifestyle changes are clearly important. When I, I think it was my very first talk in this series in the, on this channel, I talked about how to schedule your life during COVID and the importance of before you put in any work requirements or school requirements or anything else, you need the four basics, sleeping, eating, exercise, and down or relaxation time. Um, other treatment approaches we know that can be helpful, meditation, relaxation, restorative. And again, for many people with ADHD, that means starting with yoga or guided meditation or breathing approaches rather than just saying, sit on a mat and make your mind go blank. That's pretty hard for most people, but particularly hard for ADHD. I think limiting social media exposure, I think getting it out of schools, and again, not just out of each classroom, because if kids are running in the 10 minutes before class or between classes to check their phones, that means a considerable part of the time in their classroom, they're thinking about it, they're anticipating are being distracted even if it's not immediately present. Um, I also strongly support you know, banning on cell phones when you're driving. And it's again, so many people focus, well, my hands are free. It's not your hands, it's your attention. So social legal remedies in terms of changing our exposure to social media, putting coercive pressure on the big tech companies that are Promoting excessive use, um, going on self-holidays all may be helpful. And again, there are things you can do in your own life, but this is going to be a big project that affects all of us. But if we don't start acting, our society is going to keep moving in an ever more fragmented, ever more reactive, reflexive rather than reflective condition. There may be advantages to that, but I certainly think there's a lot of potential disadvantages. So that's all I have to say for today. Stay healthy and happy, and I'll be back next week. And there'll be a question and answer focused on this on Tuesdays, um, 2 o'clock West Coast, 5 o'clock East Coast time.